10 doctors who specialize in interstitial lung disease at UAB, and I'm one of those doctors. And so um, Dr. Case asked me to come today and talk to you about environmental, environment-related interstitial lung disease. Um, it's not a particular specialty of mine, but we do see patients with this in our clinic, and so I'm going to run through some of the things that can, in our environments, that can cause interstitial lung disease today. So <clears throat> the most common environmental lung disease, though, is COPD. So COPD is much more prevalent than um, all the interstitial lung diseases that we deal with and smoking, pollution, uh, burning fuels worldwide um, for uh, cooking. Uh, causes much more lung disease in general than all the other environmental uh, factors that I'm going to talk about today. So these are some of the environmental things that we'll be talking about today, some of the wide variety of things in our environments that can uh, cause interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis, and so we're going to touch on many of these things today and talk about them in particular, okay? So uh, again, what we're going to be talking about is, as Dr. Case um, very well explained to you in her first talk, is, a, is what interstitial lung disease is. And so uh, more common is COPD, where you get these airways affected. But uh, what we're going to talk about is when you get down to these little air sacs and the diseases that affect the actual lung tissue and how environment can uh, play a role in that. So again, I think she did a good job of looking at this, but we're talking about these diseases that affect these little tiny spaces in the lungs. Uh, this is a, another picture of that. And there's just these, uh, where we get the thickening and the inflammation in these areas where we have gas exchange between the lung tissue and the blood vessels. And so a lot of the things we're going to talk about have very similar symptoms and uh, treatments, uh, but we're going to talk about how the environment affects these. So these are some of the uh, long list of um, environmental causes that can cause interstitial lung disease. So one of the big categories is actually occupational exposure. So when you come to the doctor, uh, when you come to an interstitial lung disease clinic, one of the first things we're going to talk to you about is what you do for a living. And we're not just going to say, what do you do? And you can say, I work in a foundry. We need to know what you do in that foundry. We need to know what you're inhaling, what you're exposed to. Are you using a respirator? How long have you been doing that? What were you doing 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago? Those things are all very important to us. And so um, you'll probably, we'll probably talk to you more about your life and what you've been doing, and not only you, but also what your spouse has been doing, because um, that's really important when trying to understand the cause of interstitial lung disease. We're also going to talk to you about your home environment. What kind of house do you live in? Uh, how old is it? Have you ever had a water heater break? Have you ever had any water damage? Is that, have you ever lived through a hurricane and had water damage in your home? And so we're going to talk to you about hot tubs, humidifiers. Not only are we going to talk to you about your home environment, but other environments where you spend a lot of time. Do you spend a lot of time at your family member's house? Do you spend a lot of time in an office building? What does that office building look like? Does, has it ever had water damage? And so we're going to ask you a lot of questions related to both your work and your home environment and also hobbies. So um, do you do a lot of woodworking? Are you a painter? Do you make cheese? And also, what kind of pets do you have in your home? Um, and then just any, in general, anything that you could be worried about in your environment that may be affecting your lung disease. So idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, Dr. Case talked to you a lot about that. That's probably one of the more common diseases that people in this room are dealing with is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And I'm always asked by my patients if idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is an environmental disease. And the question is, is that we don't really know. Um, we do know that it's a heterogeneous disease. So what causes IPF in one patient is probably very different than what causes IPF in another patient. But we don't really completely understand all those causes at this point. We do know that there are some environmental risk factors that make you more prone to getting pulmonary fibrosis like smoking and occupations where you're exposed to a lot of dust. But not every IPF patient has these risk factors. Um, and so we're still not sure the, the complete role that the environment plays in the development of IPF. And you look, if you look at the current pathogenesis paradigm, so what, why do we think IPF happens? I think most of us believe is that it is an interplay between our genetics so what genes we were born with and how those genes react to the environment throughout our life, how we age, 
So how does your body aging and how has it changed throughout your life and it, as you've gotten older? And then also the environment that you've been, been exposed to. So we do believe that repeated injury in the lung can promote fibrosis. And so if you've had a lot of um, exposures in your environment throughout your life that have caused ongoing lung injury, then we think that that can be important in the development of uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. But again, there's that idiopathic word where we really don't know the exact cause of this disease. And so is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis an environmental disease? It probably plays a role, but we don't know those exact exposures at this time, and we don't know how much of a role it actually plays in the development of the disease. So I don't think any of us would call it an environmental lung disease at this point, but the environment is probably important. So for the rest of the talk, I'm actually going to uh, talk about some diseases where we know that the environment is important in causing the disease, and we know what the specific exposure is and what those specific diseases are, okay? So first I'm going to talk about occupational lung disease. So we're going to talk about asbestosis, silicosis, coal workers pneumoconiosis, and borreliosis. Okay. So asbestosis. So asbestos is a naturally occurring fiber. It's composed of hydrated magnesium silicate. There's multiple different kinds of asbestos that you can find in the environment. Uh, there's blue, there's brown, there's white. Uh, this is what the white form looks like naturally occurring. Um, in the environment, and so, and this is a pipe covered in asbestos fibers, okay? So asbestos was used as an insulation material for many, many years. Uh, we don't use it anymore since the 1980s, but you will find in especially older homes and older buildings a lot of asbestos. And so, um, so the people who are at risk of getting asbestosis are people who worked in these um, occupations. So construction workers, especially people who are involved in insulation, pipe fitting, electricians, people who've been crawling around in the crawl spaces of old homes, um, welders and laborers. So shipbuilding, we often ask if you've built ships in the, in the war or at any time during military service. Railroad workers, um, patients who've worked in textile or paper mills often had a lot of asbestos exposure. Boiler makers, steam fitters, machinists, anywhere where there's a lot of high heat and insulation materials are needed to protect you from high heat, um, we'll find a lot of people who uh, were exposed to asbestos. And it really needs to be patients who were exposed to the asbestos fibers. So if you were in a building that had asbestos in the ceiling, that's not going to cause asbestosis. What you need to have done is really to have gotten those fibers up in the air and breathe those in. So solid asbestos is probably not going to cause asbestosis, but um, what you have to do is if somebody cuts a lot of asbestos and those fibers are aerosolized, probably uh, my patient with the most classic asbestosis, his exposure was he worked in a um, foundry and he had to actually make the asbestos tiles. And he would take asbestos powder, so the fibers, and dump it into a barrel and pour water into it and then get down into the barrel with his hands and mix it. And so it was just inhaling all that stuff for years and years. And he had class, I have his CAT scan here, he has classic asbestosis. And so, um, so it's not just somebody who's been in a building with asbestos, but more people who work with asbestos and uh, aerosolize those fibers and didn't use a um, respirator. So the clinical syndrome of um, asbestosis is really a pulmonary fibrosis. So this is one of those things that can mimic idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, so it can range from pulmonary fibrosis to just benign pleural disease, so benign disease of the lining around the lung, all the way to a severe cancer called mesothelioma, which you've probably heard um, commercials about. But this is a unique cancer to patients who had large asbestos exposure. Um, so, But for the interstitial lung disease with asbestosis, Patients usually don't present with symptoms until at least 20 to 30 years after their exposure. So having been in a building with asbestos in the past five years is not going to cause your pulmonary fibrosis. This is something that would have occurred many decades ago. Um, slow onset of shortness of breath and cough. It's, very, it's actually usually a slowly progressive disease in contrast to idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This disease usually progresses over decades. It's not that more rapid progression of pulmonary fibrosis that our IPF patients get. 
and it's really the inhalation of those fibers that cause direct toxic effects to the lungs over years. Those fibers, once you inhale them, they get down into the lungs and they don't ever leave. And so those fibers just cause slow toxic effects over many, many years. <coughs> so when we look at a CAT scan with asbestosis, one of the main clues that we have that your pulmonary fibrosis might be from asbestos as opposed to idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is that the lining around the lung will be thick and it'll have a lot of calcium in it. That is a pathognomonic feature of asbestosis. It's usually in the lower lobes, just like IPF. And uh, the, the fibrosis itself can look very similar to IPF, although often in asbestosis we get these bands of tissue that run across the lung, kind of parallel to the outside of the lung, and can kind of go from one side of the lung to the other. We still see the septal thickening and bronchiectasis that Dr. Case talked about. And when it gets advanced, it can get that honeycomb change like we see in IPF. But again, that usually takes many more years with asbestosis than it does for IPF. And so this is my patient that I was telling you about that mixed the barrels of asbestosis. So in his lower lobes, you can see he's got fibrotic changes, so right around the edges. These are his pleural plaques. So see that outside of the lung has all this white stuff in it? That's calcium. It's kind of like bone in the, out, in the lining of your lung. And he's got them all around the outsides of his lung. There's some up here too. And then he has these pleural bands that I talked about. So these lines that go from one side of the lung to the other. And some of them run parallel. Some of them just come straight out perpendicular into the pleura. But this is pretty classic asbestosis. Okay. And I've been following this guy for about eight years, and he has slowly progressed, but very slowly. He's not on oxygen yet. Um, and so, um, so this is a little bit different disease for, from pulmonary fibrosis, but it can be confused. But one of those things that we look for is this calcium around the outside of the lung. And management of this disease is um, supportive. So oxygen, pulmonary rehab, vaccinations, avoiding infection. Like I said, it's generally slowly progressive, and many patients can live decades with this disease, but you are at a higher risk of cancer when you've had asbestos exposure. Okay. And we don't know about the drugs that we use for IPF for these diseases. Um, there's trials looking at that, but we're not sure if they're going to be beneficial for these diseases or not. The next one we're going to talk about is silicosis. So silica is a, um, also a naturally occurring uh, molecule, or, uh, mineral that uh, people who work, especially in mines, so coal mines or hard rock mines, um, anybody doing hydraulic fracturing of gas and oil wells, um, stone cutting, working in quarries, foundry work, blast furnaces, big one is sandblasting, so people who sandblast for a living, even those who sandblast denim to make our, you know, our nice uh, fashion jeans um, are at risk for this. Uh, Dental assistants who sandblast the dentistry um, appliances to try to mold them. Uh, people who inter install these uh, granite and uh, quartz countertops can be at risk. Um, patients or uh, people who uh, use silica flour, people who make glass, there's a lot of silica in glass, cement and concrete, uh, masonry, and people who do ceramics. So people who have ceramics as a hobby, this is one of those things that can be a, a risk factor. Uh, so uh, acute silicosis can occur to, uh, within a few weeks to a few years after your exposure to silica. It can lead to a cough, shortness of breath, chest pain, fever, weight loss. And on imaging, we get kind of diffuse nodules and uh, consolidated airspace. And if we do the bronchoscopy that Dr. Uh, Case talked about and we get some fluid back from the lungs, it can actually look li milky and full of protein, okay? And uh, we usually do that to rule out other causes of lung disease um, in patients with silicosis. And this is what a CAT scan will look like. So this looks very different from IPF. All right, you've got all these diffuse, big uh, areas that look like pneumonia or little tiny nodules and septal thickening. Um, so this is uh, very different from what we would see in IPF and presents very differently. Um, again, uh, with acute silicosis, so these are usually people that get a very large dose of silica where they inhale a very large dose of um, silica, like if they were sandblasting or um, involved in mining and they got a very large inhalation of silica. We treat them with oxygen, rehab, infections and vaccinations. 
We sometimes can give steroids, but uh, there's some concern that it may promote fibrosis. Uh, there's been case reports of actually going in and trying to wash out the lung and get that silica out of there. Um, transplant is a possibility, but unfortunately for these patients who get these large silica inoculations, this can be a very rapidly, progressively fatal disease. I had one young man, about 32, who was sandblasting inside um, large concrete tunnels uh, for a factory, and um, he got acute silicosis, and he died within about four to five months of presenting. Um, and so uh, it was a, a really sad case. And so this can be very serious, and that's why we have OSHA and all the requirements to wear respirators when patients are doing this. Can you still hear me if I pull it back? Yeah, yeah okay, good, sorry. I tried clipping it, I don't think that, could you hear me when it was clipped down here? Can you hear me with it here? Okay. I will try to keep it where there's no feedback and where I, uh, you can still hear me. So can you hear me here? Yeah, Perfect, okay. So um, with silica, you can also get chronic silicosis, which is, um, where you have a uh, low level exposure over many years. So usually symptoms present 10 to 20 years after exposure. And these patients aren't the ones that get huge inoculations of silica, but it just gets slow, uh, small levels of silica over many years. These patients can be asymptomatic. They can have cough and dyspnea, or they can have chronic bronchitis. And um, these patients get uh, little nodules throughout the lungs. And sometimes these nodules will coalesce to cause what we call progressive massive fibrosis, where you get these big consolidations of, fib of fibrotic disease in the lungs. Um, it can sometimes be confused with cancer. Um, so the PET scans and stuff that we use to look for cancer can be confusing with this disease. Um, but one of the clues is that the lymph nodes in the chest will get these calcifications um, called eggshell calcifications. And these are just some uh, pictures of what um, chronic or simple silicosis looks like where you get all these tiny little nodules all throughout the lung. And you can see just these tiny little, little uh, nodules that will occur throughout the lung. And if you biopsy these, you can actually see these uh, silica nodules. So they'll just be fibrosis around these little um, specks of silica in the lung. And then those can progress to where those nodules kind of come together and form these big, large nodules called uh, progressive massive fibrosis. And uh, right here, you can see these big coalescence of nodules in the lung. And patients can live with this for a long time. Some patients do progress to respiratory failure with um, progressive massive fibrosis. But some patients actually do pretty well with this chronic form of silicosis. So again, supportive care. Steroids are not recommended. Getting patients to stop smoking. Prognosis is variable. Sometimes it can be fatal, but sometimes patients actually do fairly well with this. Um, we have to watch very carefully for complications. For some reason, when patients have this silica disease in their lungs, they're more prone to getting tuberculosis and other infections that are simul similar to tuberculosis. They can get um, pneumothorax, so they can collapse their lungs. They're more prone to their lungs collapsing. Um, they can actually develop other uh, systemic diseases like uh, rheumatoid arthritis-like syndromes where you get inflammation in the joints, and they can actually get kidney disease. So this can be more not just confined to the lungs, but affect the rest of the body. Um, co-workers pneumoconiosis, this is something that we actually see um, not uncommonly in Alabama. We've got a lot of co-workers in Alabama. I would expect that y'all would see some of this in um, Georgia as well. So this is black lung, um, and it's inhalation of the silica-free coal dust particles. And you get what we call coal macules in the lung spaces, in those air spaces in the lung. And um, eventually those will uh, progress to where you have these large black masses in the lungs with these liquefied centers, um, and that's why it's called black lung. And it looks very similar to silicosis. It's usually in the upper part of the lungs. You can get nodules and consolidations. You also can get the progressive massive fibrosis with co-workers pneumoconiosis. And you can actually get progression to where you get pulmonary fibrosis as well. But again, this tends to be in the upper part of the lungs, not the lower part of the lungs, so it's usually fairly distinguishable from idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And these are just some pictures of what we see in patients with black lung. So just kind of nonspecific changes in the upper parts of the lung. Nodules, consolidations, you can get some scarring. 
fibrotic changes. And again, with co-workers pneumoconiosis or black lung, there's really not a whole lot that we can do. Just supportive care with oxygen, rehab, and monitoring. You can get a lung transplant if you have co-workers pneumoconiosis. And really the prognosis just kind of depends on the extent of the disease and any complications that you get. Some people can have mild black lung and live with it for a long time. Some patients will progress to respiratory failure and die of their black lung. Again, just like silica, you can get TB and the atypical TB-like infections. You can get something called Kaplan syndrome where you get rheumatoid arthritis associated with the black lung. They're more prone to lung cancer, and you can also get pulmonary hypertension, which I will hear about later in the day. And the final occupational interstitial lung disease I'm going to talk about is beryliosis. So beryllium is a metal that's found naturally in the environment. Um, it's often alloyed with copper, aluminum, and nickel, and it's super strong. It's uh, six times stronger than steel, and it's used in a variety of industrial applications, so aerospace engineering applications, computers, technology, so all those little chips and stuff that we have in all of our electronics. A lot of those contain beryllium. Machine shops, jewelry making, um, the defense industry uses a lot of beryllium. And so beryliosis occurs when you get inhalation of the beryllium metal into your lungs. And what happens is, is that you actually get an immunologic reaction to the beryllium. So your immune system sees the beryllium in your lungs and thinks it has to get rid of it. And it causes a lot of inflammation in the lungs. And it causes a disease very similar to sarcoidosis. If anybody in this room has heard of that, that's a nonspecific inflammatory disease of the lung. This looks very similar to sarcoidosis where your T cells cause these granulomas to occur in the lung. And it can manifest as cough, shortness of breath, fever, weight loss, night sweats, fatigue, cutaneous nodules. We don't see a lot of beryliosis in Alabama. We don't have that type of industry in Alabama. Um, Dr. Cosgrove, I think, sees a lot more of that at National Jewish than we do. But we have a couple of cases of patients that we follow with beryliosis. On the imaging, you can see lymph node enlargement in the chest, lots of nodules in the lungs, some fibrosis, and some pleural thickening. So a lot of just nonspecific findings. And one of the things that we can actually do with beryllium is there's actually a blood test that we can do to look for beryliosis, where we actually um, take your blood cells, your lymphocytes out of the blood, and we expose them to beryllium and see if, they ca if that causes a reaction and causes your blood cells to release a lot of um, factors that can cause inflammation. And we can also biopsy the lungs and look for these granulomas from the beryllium. Um, the treatment of beryliosis is uh, steroids and other drugs that suppress the immune system to try to reduce the inflammation in the lung. Um, and it uh, has variable prognosis. Um, some patients can progress to respiratory failure and need for lung transplant with beryliosis. Some patients do well with just getting away from the beryllium, not inhaling anymore, and treating with drugs that suppress the immune system. So, um, so it's fairly var variable with um, beryliosis. So that's where I was going to stop with occupational lung disease. So those are the main um, diseases that uh, we think about with the interstitium being involved when you're exposed to um, things in your environment. So asbestos, silica, the coal dust with coal workers, and beryllium. Um, and so now I'm going to switch um, gears to talk about hypersensitivity pneumonitis. This is much more common in our ILD clinics than the beryllium. So Hypersensitivity pneumonitis is an immunologic reaction. These granulomas that we talked about with beryllium, you can actually get those granulomas in your lungs from a, uh, environmental causes that everybody, that all of us see in our daily environment, but some people are just more prone to getting granulomatous inflammation in the lungs when they breathe these things in. And we, it can be acute, subacute, or chronic, and it can be diagnosed based on your history, the CAT scans, labs, BAL, biopsy. And also we can see if we just get the, uh, what, what's causing it out of your environment, do you get better? Smokers are less likely to get this, but um, it's not a hard and fast rule. So if you get acute hypersensitivity pneumonitis, you often get what feels like pneumonia, fevers, chills, shortness of breath, wheezing. Um, with subacute, so if, you, the, if the exposure has been in your environment for a longer period of time, um, you can get more uh, symptoms on a scale of weeks to months. And with chronic um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, it's just like IPF. You get this slow, 
progressive dyspnea and cough, and it can be very hard to distinguish between IPF and chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis when we see patients in the clinic. So that's the um, general time frame. And these are the exposures that we worry about with chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So farmers who are exposed to moldy hay, grain, or silage, Anybody with any birds in their living environment can get chronic or, or hypersensitivity pneumonitis. People who use a hot tub on a regular basis, people who have humidifiers in their home, use a sauna on a regular basis, lifeguards who are exposed to uh, a lot of um, water. People who have water damage in their home can actually get specific types of mold that can cause hypersensitivity pneumonitis. People who work in labs with rats and gerbils, people who are exposed to a lot of wood dust, uh, people who compost a lot, and then machine operators. There's some bacteria that can be in the fluids that you use for machine operation that can cause hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And then as Dr. Case showed you before, there is a whole list of very rare things that most people don't do, but that can uh, expose you to hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So when we ask you about your hobbies, we need to know, do you make wine? Do you make cheese? Are you a do you upholstery a lot of fabric? What do you do for fun? Are you, and are you doing any of these things that can cause exposures that can lead to hypersensitivity pneumonitis? There is a way that we can test the blood, but it's not always positive, and it kind of gives us variable results. We can do a bronchoscopy where we look to see if you've got a lot of lymphocytes in your lungs, or if we can do a biopsy with the bronchoscopy to see if you've got these granulomas in your lungs. And this is what this uh, looks like on a CAT scan. So with acute um, in subacute hypersensitivity pneumonitis, we get a lot of uh, ground glass opacities and tiny little nodules in the lungs. I don't know how well that projects, but you get these tiny little nodules, especially in the upper parts of the lungs. Um, so we talked a little bit about this already. I'm just going to breeze through this. So you get these um, infiltrates and little nodules, and you get these granulomas throughout the lungs, these little nodule-like granulomas from inflammation, so breathing in a bird protein, and your body has an inflammatory response to it. Chronic HP is what we're more concerned about because this can really mimic idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And you get a, a very similar disease to what we see in IPF where you get fibrosis in the lungs. And you can actually get honeycombing in the lungs. But one of the things that we look for that you should not see in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is air trapping, where air actually gets trapped in the lungs when you expire. So that's one of the reasons why we get these high-resolution CAT scans where we actually take a uh, picture of your lungs when you've blown all the air out of your lungs so we can see if air gets trapped. So, and in general, the way we treat chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis is we try to get the antigen out of your environment. We can give you steroids and other drugs that suppress inflammation. But unfortunately, once you get to the chronic stage of this disease, um, then no matter what we do, a lot of times the fibrosis will progress very similar to IPF and patients will need oxygen and lung transplant. Um, and again, what we're looking at are just these fibrotic areas, all this fibrosis with areas of inflammation and granuloma formation. So we, try, we will tell you if you come to us and you've got a bird in your house and you've got pulmonary fibrosis, we will tell you to get rid of the bird, to clean your house thoroughly. If you've got mold in your home, you've got to have somebody come in take all the drywall out, get all the mold out of there. And sometimes we actually, in patients with chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, when we cannot figure out what the antigen is that is causing it, we recommend patients move. Just sell your house and move to another place. And we've had patients that have had to do that to try to get improvement in their lung function. We can give steroids and uh, steroid sparing agents like Imuran and uh, Celsap, but a lot of these patients end up needing transplant. So these are the exposures that we talked about. So lots of occupational exposures, asbestos, coal mining, beryllium, and then hypersensitivity pneumonitis, things in your environment that can lead to granuloma formation and fibrosis that can actually mimic, mimic IPF. So when we're asking you if you have a bird in your house, it's not because we're crazy. It's because this is really important. This is one of those common things that can cause pulmonary fibrosis in patients, farmers, hot tubs, mold in the home. Um, and so, any questions about that? What's the hot tub activity? Yeah, so the hot tub there, um, so in the hot tub there are these microorganisms that can grow in really hot water that can be found in hot tubs. And when you're in a hot tub and you've got all that steam coming up, it actually aerosolizes those microorganisms.
and they don't cause an infection in the lung. They're not the type of organisms that infect our lungs, but our immune system can see that and act those uh, organisms in our lung and actually cause a hypersensitivity pneumonitis to those and cause interstitial lung disease. Humidifiers, yeah, humidifiers where you've actually got a reservoir of water, very similar to the hot tub or the lifeguard. There are microorganisms that can that thrive on those reservoirs of water. And when you've got a humidifier and you um, aerosolize that in your home, you can actually get those microorganisms that you're breathing in on a regular basis and get this immunologic reaction in the lungs that leads to pulmonary fibrosis. Not a dehumidifier, yes. Yeah, I, I think we don't know about that yet. We've had a couple of patients where we have highly suspected that their hypersensitivity pneumonitis might be due to the CPAP machine. All we can do right now is recommend that you follow the manufacturer's instructions for cleaning that diligently. Um, there's some instructions about how to keep that clean, doing that on a regular basis to try to prevent any mold or microorganisms from forming, but regularly emptying, regularly emptying that reservoir and keeping the machine as clean as possible but we do have some concerns that maybe in some patients that there are these microorganisms that they just can't get rid of. And in some cases, we've actually had them get new CPAP machines. Yep. I don't know if I missed it when you were saying it. The picture right above the hot tub, which is just showing the jeans. The jeans, yeah. Yeah, so people who sandblast jeans can actually get silicosis. Yeah, so that's one of the... Fashion industry has to be careful about that, yeah? Yeah. Okay. And then the next one is, what about the oil diffusers? Um, we don't know. Um, we don't know. Uh, so there is a form of interstitial lung disease called lipoid pneumonia, where when you get oils down into the lung, it can actually cause interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis. Um, we do not recommend directly nebulizing oils into your lungs. We don't know if that's safe. Just nebulizing the oils into the environment, we don't know if that can cause problems or not. Um, and so you kind of do that at your own risk at this point. Um, we just don't have the data to know if that's safe or not. Yep. What about kitty litter? I don't know of any problem with kitty litter. Now, there's a, there's a microorganism called toxoplasmosis that can live in kitty litter that we get concerned about in immunosuppressed patients like uh, cancer patients, HIV patients, pregnant women. But in general, that should not cause ILD. Yeah. We don't worry about cats or dogs. Cats and dogs are fine. On the humidifier, is the cool water humidifier okay? We don't know. Um, but a cool water can also har harbor microorganisms. And so it's better than warm water, but it can be a risk factor. And it, does it take a long time to be treated? Or is it just so usually with the chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, that's over years of exposure. So, yeah. Yes. So...